Do the laws of nature exclude miracles? Are the laws of nature absolute? Miracles in the world religions Miracles are prevalent features of religions. In the Indian traditions, Krishna lifted up a mountain to protect the world against rain sent by the god Indra. Modern-day gurus like Sai Baba regularly work miracles, producing rings and even statuettes out of thin air, and healing devotees of various ailments. The Buddha, according to the Jataka tales in the Pali Canon, emerged from his mother's side, stood up, began to walk, and declared that he would not be born again. In the Semitic traditions, the series of ten miraculous plagues and the drying up of the Sea of Reeds to enable the Hebrews to escape from Egypt, the Exodus, are commemorated each year in Jewish Passover ceremonies. The canonical Gospels record thirty-five miracles that Jesus performed, twenty-three of them miraculous healings, and nine nature miracles, like walking on water, stilling a storm, producing food out of nothing, and turning water into wine. Three times he is said to have brought the dead back to life. And, of course, the virgin birth and Jesus' own resurrection from death are integral parts of the Christian creed. In Islam, many miracles are recorded in the Quran, and the Quran itself is said to be the greatest of miracles, being such that no ordinary human poet could have created a text of such beauty and power. This Quran is not such as can be produced by other than God. Miracles are less important in the East Asian traditions, but even there the lives of the great religious teachers are surrounded by stories of their extraordinary powers and more than human wisdom. The creation and end-of-the-world stories in ancient scriptures have been relegated to the realm of mythology, of literally false accounts with spiritual meaning, by the discoveries of modern science. Can we, or must we, do the same thing with the miracle stories that are such a prominent feature of most religions? Some, like the stories of Krishna, do seem mythological in this sense. The central story of Krishna and the milkmaids, gopis, for instance, could easily be taken as a symbol of the deep emotional love between Krishna and his devotees, rather than a genuinely historical account. And the story of the Buddha's miraculous birth, probably not written down until four hundred years after it occurred, sounds like a common mythological motif, found in many cultures throughout the world, of a miraculous birth for a great god or hero. The story of a miraculous conception for Jesus is only related in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke, in rather different versions, and is in some tension with other Gospel accounts that speak of Mary's failure to understand Jesus' mission, or of his cousin John the Baptist not being sure if he were the Messiah, even though a truly miraculous conception should have made that pretty clear. In Christian tradition there later developed an added belief that Jesus' birth too was miraculous, leaving Mary fully a virgin, and the non-canonical Gospels record various miracles Jesus performed as a child. One, making a clay bird and then getting it to fly away, is mentioned in the Quran. But such stories seem frankly petty, and some of them, that is one about punishing an objectionable schoolteacher, are even unsavory when looked at objectively. It seems clear that miracle stories tend to get more dramatic over time, and that legends of amazing and wonderful events, that is what miracle from the Latin miraculum means, grow greater as the years go by. When we read of medieval accounts of miracles, St. George killing the dragon, virgins, St. Uncumber, one of my favourites, instantaneously growing beards to put off unwanted suitors, and the house in which Jesus was born, flying through the clouds to Norwich and coming to rest at Walsingham, happily not too far from the bearded lady, we may well feel a twinge of scepticism. As the centuries rolled by, the unspecified number of magi, probably the references to Zoroastrian priests, who visited Jesus in his house in Bethlehem some time after his birth, turned into three kings, each named, who visited the manger, together with a crowd of shepherds, angels, cows, and sheep. The story gets more detailed as time goes by, and that is a good clue that human imagination is hard at work. Are all the miracle stories, then, products of human imagination, and if so, how does that affect religion? As we examine the religions of the world, we find many undoubted instances of myths and legends, and some common themes of miraculous births, superhuman deeds of valour, and visits to and returns from the world of the dead, surrounding the great heroes of faith. 
Nobody can think they are all true. They contradict one another about many things, and it seems a little arbitrary to say that everybody else's reported miracles are legends, whereas the miracles of our own tradition are all true. So it is reasonable to approach the subject of miracles with a sceptical mind. Moreover, most miracle stories arose within a world view in which angels and demons were fighting for dominance and for the souls of men and women, and in which storms, earthquakes, and plagues were caused either by demonic influence or some sort of divine punishment. Many of Jesus' miracles were, in fact, exorcisms of demons, who often recognized him as the Son of God and had to be commanded to keep quiet. He was fed in the wilderness by angels and tempted by the devil. In that world, there was not just a supreme cosmic consciousness, God. There were legions of spiritual powers, good and bad, causing things to happen in the world in accordance with their own plans and ambitions. In that world, there were no laws of nature. Miracles, wonderful and awe-inspiring events were to be expected, as the supernatural spirits fought and sought to demonstrate their power in the events of nature and history. Almost every event was caused by direct spiritual action, and miracles were just a particularly powerful and impressive expression of such action. Moses' miracles in Egypt were better than the miracles of the Egyptian magicians, because his God was more powerful than theirs. When God can do almost anything God wants, uninhibited by laws of nature, then it is only to be expected that the divine being will demonstrate his superior power when the occasion demands it. But when we have given up that general notion of the world and of God, can we still retain any meaningful concept of miracle? The Discovery of the Laws of Nature A divine miracle for a believer in God is an expression of the presence and power and purpose of God in an extraordinarily impressive event. Or, for non-theistic traditions like Buddhism, a miracle is an expression of the amazing power of a liberated soul that has transcended the physical limitations of ordinary human beings. Miracles in this sense, extraordinary expressions of spiritual power, are a problem for science because events in the world are no longer thought to be directly caused by supernatural spirits. The birth of modern science in the 16th century occurred partly because of the exclusion of such spiritual causes from the natural world. Francis Bacon, 1561-1626, aimed to separate metaphysics, the investigation of the ultimate nature of reality, aided by Aristotle's formal and final causes, sharply from physics, which was to be concerned only with efficient and material causes. Final causes, he said, were like the vestal virgins of ancient Rome, dedicated to God but barren. Empirical science must have nothing to do with them. The alleged purposes of finite objects or of angels and demons were not parts of science proper, which must only study the physical antecedents that bring about their effects in accordance with general, measurable, repeatable, and predictable laws. René Descartes, in 1637, at around the same time or soon after, characterized rational method in thought as that of seeking evidence for your beliefs, dividing each problem up into its constituent parts, beginning with the simple and ascending little by little to the complex, and seeking an exhaustive enumeration of the topic under review. This method, in fact, owed something to the work of Robert Grosstest, 1186-1253, Chancellor of Oxford University, who stressed the importance of analysis and measurement in observation, and who saw mathematics as a hidden language of nature. This thinking was to open up a fruitful way forward for the scientific method, which seeks to understand complex things in terms of the laws that govern the behavior of their simple parts, laws that are to be discovered by close, repeated, and publicly verifiable observation, and that are to be formulated in precise mathematical terms. The triumph of the laws of nature was completed in the work of Isaac Newton, who constructed a few simple laws of mechanics that seemed to apply to all phenomena when they were considered in relative abstraction from the very complex real-world situations in which they were perceived by common sense. Projectiles seemed to common sense to fall to earth after a while, and so Aristotle had thought they need a positive force or impetus to keep them moving. Newton demonstrated that the common sense view is mistaken, since it is factors like air resistance and gravity that cause projectiles to fall to earth. Abstractly considered, in isolation from such real-world factors, objects will continue moving in a straight line without any special impetus unless something stops them.
By using mathematical abstraction and postulating a set of universal principles that govern the behavior of the simple parts of physical objects, Newton, who published his great work Principia Mathematica in 1687, completed the revolution in physics that had begun with the criticism of Aristotelian principles by Copernicus and Galileo. The natural world could no longer be seen as the playground of supernatural spirits. It was the outcome of the application of a few universal rules of action to simple physical particles. Spirits had been driven from the universe. Henceforth, the universe could be seen as a machine. This was a huge revolution in human thinking, but it was not prompted by opposition to religion. It rather recast religion in a new mode. The writers I have mentioned all saw mathematics as the language of God, and humans as able to understand the universe mathematically because they were made in the image of God, and so could understand God's language. Angels and demons were relegated, with gnomes and fairies, to a lower level of religion, and attention was concentrated on just one supreme and perfectly rational spirit who had designed the universe as a perfect machine. Isaac Newton had no trouble with miracles, and wrote a number of extremely boring books about the biblical miracles, pointing out that God could break his own laws if he wanted to. But he did not realize that this made miracles much odder than they had previously been. Miracles had been extraordinary spiritual acts, but still acts of the same general spirit-caused sort that occur throughout the universe anyway. Now, however, miracles have to be transgressions of universal laws of nature. That is how David Hume defined them, and Hume used the word transgression advisedly to point out the absurdity, as he thought, of miraculous intervention. Why should God make a set of beautiful and elegant laws, only to break them when the divine being felt like it? Does this not make God some sort of mathematical criminal? Are Miracles Transgressions of the Laws of Nature? In his 1748 work, an inquiry concerning human understanding, David Hume's full definition of a miracle is a transgression of a law of nature by a particular volition of the deity or by the interposition of some invisible agent. This has become almost a standard definition given to all first-year philosophy students, but that definition could not have existed before the time of Newton, and the use of the words transgression and invisible agent subtly convey the impression and are meant to do so, that miracles are criminal acts by beings rather like fairies. So Hume's definition already begins to make miracles seem absurd. The philosopher Richard Swinburne, author of one of the best modern philosophical treatments of miracles, The Concept of Miracle, is reasonably happy with Hume's definition, even though he offers as an alternative the much better formulation that a miracle is an event of an extraordinary kind brought about by a god and of religious significance. But the problem with Hume's definition is that it may conjure up a picture of a universe as a machine in which every event falls under one or more of a set of universal and unbreakable mechanical laws, and in which those laws taken together give a complete and exhaustive explanation of the universe. In such a universe, any breaking of the laws seems like arbitrary interference by some person outside the machine. This picture was indeed held by many after the time of Newton, and it led to the deistic view that a perfect designer would make such good laws that no interferences would be necessary. Some even thought that the very existence of science depends upon denying the possibility that the laws of nature could be violated. For every event must have a cause. A cause is a preceding physical state plus a universal law, and if any exceptions are allowed, science and the rationality of the universe are undermined. Christian theologians were especially influenced by the deistic world view, and this sometimes led to a denial of the occurrence of miracles. Friedrich Schleiermacher, writing at the beginning of the 19th century, and sometimes called the father of liberal Protestantism, held that the miracles recorded in the Bible were literalizations of purely spiritual truths. The resurrection of Jesus, for example, may have consisted in the remarkable spiritual experiences and visions of the apostles, and in the new understanding of human existence these brought about. But Jesus' tomb was not miraculously empty, and his body did not literally rise from the dead. The twentieth-century theologian Rudolf Bultmann also regarded literal miracles as wholly legendary. Christianity, he thought, is about the possibility of a new understanding of human existence, and about inner spiritual renewal. 
It was not about the occurrence of very odd facts very long ago. It is certainly possible to have religion without miracles. A Muslim may say that the Qur'an is a unique literary and spiritual work without saying that it breaks any laws of nature. A Jew may regard the biblical record of the exodus from Egypt as a highly exaggerated and largely symbolic account of what may originally have been a series of unusual natural disasters. A Christian may regard the New Testament miracles as exaggerated accounts of the inspirational effect of the presence of Jesus, or as physical symbols of his spiritual status and authority. And a Hindu or Buddhist may similarly regard miracles as legends expressing in literal form the important spiritual teaching of the way to liberation from desire and despair. It is probably true that all major religious teachers would regard the physical occurrence of miracles as much less important than the spiritual teaching of how to overcome what Buddhists call the three fires of greed, hatred, and ignorance, and of how to achieve union with a spiritual reality of greater consciousness, wisdom, and bliss. Jesus, for example, apparently resisted all requests to provide a sign from heaven that would prove his authority. This suggests that miracles are not properly regarded as visible proofs of the existence of God. If they were, we might reasonably ask, as David Hume does, for more evidence, and for a host of personal miracles that might leave none of us in any doubt. Nevertheless, if miracles, when taken in a purely symbolic sense, testify to the superior reality of spirit, and to the possibility of spiritual liberation for beings embodied in a physical world, it might seem surprising if there were no physical symptoms of spiritual presence and liberation. There may be no demonstrative proofs of the existence of God, but surely one might expect some indications of divine presence, at least for those who wish to know more of God, who have eyes to see. For deists, the elegance and rationality of the laws of nature, the handiwork of the great mathematician, is such an indication. But it is quite hard to see that such a spiritual reality could have any active personal relation to human beings, or that human beings could be transformed by relation to it if all the thoughts and acts of humans are caused solely by the laws of the natural world. Most religions are founded on claims that spirit has acted in the world in some specific way, in freeing the Israelites, dictating the Koran, or becoming incarnate in Jesus. In non-theistic traditions, humans can be freed from the constraints of physical desire and suffering and become aware of a non-physical dimension of reality. Awareness of a non-physical reality must be partly caused by that reality. If knowledge is genuine, the object partly causes awareness of it. So there must be some causal connection between spiritual reality and the physical world. Even for a view like that of Schleiermacher, the apostles had visions of Jesus after his death. If those visions were genuine, this posits a causal interaction between the dead Jesus and the living apostles. And this might not break a law of nature, since perhaps all those who have died continue to exist in some other form after death, and some of them even appear in visions to the living, but it would be a causal influence of the spiritual after-death world upon the physical world in which the apostles still lived. If, in addition, the tomb of Jesus were, in fact, empty, this implies that the physical body of Jesus was transfigured into a spiritual form, and this would be a miracle in the sense of an extraordinary manifestation of spiritual power over the physical. Yet, for Christians, this is not just breaking a law, that dead bodies gradually decompose. All the dead, they think, are going to be transfigured at the general resurrection. Seen in that light, Jesus' transfiguration, the resurrection of his physical body to a new form of life, is unusual in its timing, but not in its occurrence. In fact, a Christian might say, there is a spiritual law that all the dead will be transfigured and will rise again. Normally, bodies decompose, but, in special circumstances, perhaps if humans are wholly filled with the divine spirit, that tendency to decompose is checked. In some cases, transfiguration— assumption into heaven in traditional terms, may follow immediately. Of course, the objection may be raised that the invention of such spiritual laws is a totally fruitless fantasy. We can always invent invisible and untestable spiritual laws to justify ridiculous opinions, but they are totally useless to science as they lead to no new predictions, and the evidence for their existence is wholly speculative, not based on public and repeatable observations. 
This objection is fair. These spiritual laws are not laws established by experiment, leading to fruitful predictions. What the believer is doing is accepting the testimony to a miracle and then thinking of some way of making its occurrence seem reasonable in the light of the alleged purposes of a god. Accordingly, much will depend upon whether it is reasonable to accept testimony to the occurrence of a miracle. Miracles as Extraordinary Manifestations of Spiritual Power To that question I will return, but I will first complete the discussion of how miracles are to be defined. If, and only if, we could credit what has been said about resurrection, the most natural way to describe matters would be to say that the normal operations of nature, the decomposition of bodies, have been modified or transcended by extraordinary events that reveal the operations of a higher spiritual but still entirely rational law, the transfiguration of bodies into spiritual form. What is at stake, therefore, is whether spirit has a specific causal influence on the physical. Such influence may be relatively normal, as when someone feels a sense of the presence of God. It may be quite unusual, as when someone has visions of a dead person, or when inspired words are placed in the mind of a prophet. Or it may be totally awe-inspiring and extraordinary, as when a physical body is transfigured into spiritual form. Seen in this light, the definition of a miracle as the transgression of a law of nature seems inadequate. The physical world is causally affected by spirit. Virtually all religious believers accept this, and their differences about whether miracles occur are differences about the extent, character, and unusualness of such spiritual causality. The inadequate picture is to think of nature as a perfect, self-sustaining machine, a closed causal realm of universal and unbreakable laws. If nature is as a whole the manifestation of spirit, then the laws of its operation will be manifestations of the nature of spirit. To put this in theistic terms, the predictable regularities of nature will manifest the faithfulness and reliability of God, who wills that we should be able to understand and use those regularities. But if God is a supreme personal reality, it is to be expected that there will also be unique and more distinctly personal forms of manifestation by which God is truly known in many forms of beauty, moral insight, and historical guidance. The universe will, in short, not be a machine. It will be more like, though not exactly like, a body, expressing both reliable regularities and specific personal actions. We do not transgress the laws of nature when we use our bodies to express personal feelings and intentions. Such expressions are not wholly explained by the laws of biology, which does not deal with them, but they do not violate laws of biology either. So maybe God should not be thought of as transgressing the regularities of the cosmos, which we have learned to describe in mathematical terms when God expresses intentions that cannot be wholly explained in terms of such regularities. Science works on the assumption that every event has a cause. This is a postulate of the rationality of the universe. There is a reason for everything that happens. It is a dogma in that it cannot be strictly proved, and it goes well beyond the available evidence. Religious believers most often accept that dogma too, but they typically claim that not all causes are physical causes, and that accounts of the universe that only mention physical laws and causes are incomplete. Purely physical laws have exceptions when they are modified by spiritual purposes. That follows from the fact that not all causes are physical causes. Where a non-physical cause operates, it will supplement and modify the influence of purely physical causes. But why should we say that the physical law is broken? We do not say that the law of gravity is broken in a case where a change in the momentum of a system modifies the operation of the law. The introduction of an additional causal factor will obviously modify laws that would otherwise operate in a simpler manner. What we should say is that physical laws apply unless other causal factors modify them. And then they continue to operate, but they are modified by another law. In the case of religion, such a law may concern the implementation of the ultimate purpose of the physical system as a whole. I can see why miracles have been defined as transgressions of law, but it would be less misleading from a religious point of view to define a miracle as an extraordinary manifestation of spiritual power. There are no otherwise unbreakable laws that have to be arbitrarily broken by an external interference, and we do not have to think of some invisible person suddenly deciding on a whim to break a law.
The key questions we need to ask are whether there is any spiritual causal power and whether it may sometimes manifest in extraordinary ways. When put like that, it is easy to see that God, if there is a God, the creator of the universe, is a supreme spiritual causal power, though it would demean God to think of the deity as an invisible person. And it is quite possible that God might manifest the divine presence in extraordinary ways. We would just have to look and see. Hume's Argument That Miracles Are Absolutely Impossible David Hume set things up so that we would never find a miracle however hard we look. Commenting on alleged miracles that occurred around the tomb of Abbe Paris, he concedes that many of them were immediately proved upon the spot before judges of unquestioned integrity attested by witnesses of credit and distinction in a learned age and on the most eminent theatre that is now in the world. That sounds pretty impressive. But Hume's response is this. What have we to oppose to such a cloud of witnesses but the absolute impossibility or miraculous nature of the events which they relate? All reasonable people, he says, will take that assertion as a sufficient refutation. But how does he know that miracles, by his definition, transgressions of laws of nature, are absolutely impossible? The irony is that according to Hume's own general philosophical principles, we cannot lay down in advance that anything is impossible. Experience is our only guide. Experience can only tell us what has happened so far in our very limited lifespan in a small region of the earth. It cannot tell us what the future will be like, or even whether the future will be like the past. It cannot tell us whether things are very different in different parts of the world, or for people other than ourselves. It cannot tell us that there is any necessity in the laws of nature that renders them impervious to change or alteration. One of the major conclusions of Hume's philosophy is that necessity cannot be shown to be an objective property of nature. We might think that the laws of nature are necessary, that there is some inner necessity that connects the same causes invariably with the same effects, but this is, he argues, an illusion. All we have is a customary connection made in human thought or imagination between two states which have been observed always to have followed one another in the past. Just because two states have been observed always to follow one another in the past, it by no means follows that they will always do so in the future. It does not even follow that they have always done so in the past, since we have only seen a tiny part of the past. So it seems that our belief that there are laws of nature that events necessarily obey is only a habit of thought, founded on very limited experience. It may very easily be wrong. What on earth, according to Hume's own principles, could justify him in saying that an event that does not fall under a law of nature, such a law being no more than an invariable constant conjunction of two events, is absolutely impossible? Nothing more than habit, or, we might as readily say, prejudice. It is not all reasonable people who will reject the possibility of miracles. It is incorrigibly prejudiced people who cannot rid themselves of ingrained habits of thought. Hume actually concedes that events breaking laws of nature may occur, after all, but not, he says, where religion is concerned. Should this miracle be ascribed to any new system of religion, men in all ages have been so much imposed on by ridiculous stories of that kind that this very circumstance would be a full proof of a cheat, and would justify all men of sense in rejecting it without further examination. A careful initial scepticism about reports of miracles has been replaced by a full proof of deceit, a proof so complete that it needs no examination. Prejudice has rarely been quite so clearly expressed in the history of philosophy. Is there a firm and unalterable experience that establishes absolute laws of nature? Hume says that no proof is needed in particular cases because a firm and unalterable experience has established the laws of nature. As a uniform experience amounts to a proof, there is here a direct and full proof against the existence of any miracle. But is it the case that a firm, unalterable and uniform experience established the laws of nature? Whose experiences are we talking about here? For thousands of years, nobody realized that there were any laws of nature. There were, of course, many observed regularities, but there were also many odd events that did not seem to fit into regular patterns at all. Common sense seems to show that things mostly happen regularly and predictably. The sun rises each morning and sets each evening. 
But common sense suggests that not everything in life is regular and predictable. What my children are going to do next, or whether a volcano will erupt. In terms of common sense, these events are anomalous and unpredictable. I'm not suggesting these are miracles. I'm just saying that the common experience of most people throughout human history is that there are both regularities and anomalous and unpredictable events. The very idea of a law of nature is, at best, a late medieval idea that came to fruition in the 16th century. To frame the idea required genius, not common sense. It required a leap of faith that mathematics is the language of nature, and a determination to probe beneath sensory appearances to reduce phenomena to the operation of unwritten, mathematically specifiable laws upon unseen particles of which visible objects were said to be composed. This is a huge leap of imagination. So whose firm, unalterable and uniform experience establishes a law of nature? Only people who can solve differential equations, who are capable of postulating unseen atoms underlying the objects we perceive with our senses, and who can devise precise laws stating ideal relations between those atomic particles. The experiences in question are not experiences of common sense, they are the experiences of intellectual giants. Since Newton's day, the laws of nature have become exponentially more difficult, mathematically, to the extent that hardly one person in a million could even state the laws of quantum field theory, let alone understand them. The firm atomic particles that were supposed to be the foundation of matter have disintegrated into the particle zoo of neutrons, gravitons, positrons, quarks, and goodness knows how many other flickering and transient entities. Only highly trained people with graduate degrees in physics who work with particle accelerators are in any position even to identify such particles, and the deterministic laws of Newtonian mechanics have been subsumed into stochastic laws of quantum and chaos theory and models of multidimensional space-time that seem to most of us indistinguishable from the visions of science fiction. It is nevertheless true that many laws of physics can be said to be well established, and that the formulation of such laws constitutes the triumph of modern scientific method. It is still all a very long way from common sense. It is an equally long way from Hume's own empirical philosophy, whereby you just construct human knowledge by inference from immediate sensory impressions. Observation is important in modern science, but it is not a matter of attending very closely to the sensory impressions that occur in everyday experience. A physical scientist has to build an apparatus in which such things as temperature and pressure, radiation background and electromagnetic fields can be precisely controlled. Then, a theory has to be constructed in accordance with which certain future observations in this closely controlled environment can be predicted. An experiment has to be set up, and the results recorded by the use of sophisticated instruments whose readings need to be interpreted by a highly trained observer. Finally, wherever possible, the whole thing is repeated, varying the boundary conditions and usually modifying calculations to fit the observed results more closely. Good scientific work in physics is not something that just anybody can do. It requires great mathematical skill, a fertile imagination, the ability to think up fruitful experimental situations, a sort of intuitive feel for an elegant theory, and the courage to challenge established thinking and try out apparently wild ideas. Any physicist who talks about a firm, unalterable and uniform experience as the backing for the formulation of a law of nature will be rightly laughed out of the laboratory. Quantum Theory and the laws of nature. Of course, theories and experimental results do get established, and a moderately competent scientist can trust and use them once they have been published by a thinker of genius and accepted by a reputable peer group. But those thinkers of genius will always be looking for what has been missed, for counterexamples that current theories cannot explain, and for anomalies and discrepancies that point to the need for new and possibly revolutionary forms of theoretical explanation. None of that means that there are no laws of nature, but it does mean that we should not be too sure that we really know what they are, or that we are on the verge of explaining absolutely everything by means of them, or that we may not get a huge surprise at any time that may disprove all previous theories. This happened to Newton's laws with the advent of quantum theory in the early twentieth century. The principles of Newtonian mechanics were not shown to be totally incorrect, 
They had worked well for over two hundred years, and were a pretty reliable guide to how middle-sized objects moving slowly relative to the speed of light behave. But Einstein's theory of relativity subsumed those laws under a wider set of more fundamental laws, and showed them to offer only a limited and incomplete explanation of gravitational attraction. They do not work for very small or very fast particles, and they omit all mention of the basic nuclear and electromagnetic forces that play a large part in determining the behavior of all fundamental particles. In the light of discoveries in physics since 1905, when Einstein published his paper on the photoelectric effect, it has become accepted by all competent physicists that Newton's laws of motion and gravitation do not provide a complete, closed, and deterministic account of the physical universe. They are not complete because they fail to account for many physical phenomena. They do not form a closed system, for there are many factors they do not even mention, like dark energy, dark matter, quantum fields, and non-locality, that modify the operation of Newton's laws in major ways. And they do not offer a deterministic account because we now know that it is impossible, in principle, to predict the future completely. This is because Heisenberg's principle of indeterminacy means that we can never determine both the position and the momentum of a subatomic particle. So we can never have precise knowledge of all the properties of an initial physical state. Not only that, on the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum events, there is nothing, certainly nothing knowable by us, that precisely determines a change in quantum state of a subatomic particle. Exactly the same physical state of an atom can have a number of alternative future states. That is, the same cause can have different effects. And we can assign no physical cause for which effect is actualized. This finding undermines a highly cherished dogma of classical physicists, the dogma that every cause, every initial state, can have one and only one effect. That is, that causes sufficiently determine their effects. This is the dogma of physical determinism. Given an initial state and the laws of physics, all effects follow by necessity from their causes. No alternatives are permitted. This dogma cannot be proved in any way. The most we could say before the rise of quantum physics was that, as far as we have been able to determine, the same initial states always give rise to the same effects, as Hume might say, unalterably and uniformly. Some philosophers, Immanuel Kant, for example, have thought that this principle of sufficient causality is entailed by the rationality of the universe and is a precondition of scientific research. For if we introduced uncaused causes into the universe, we would have introduced a principle of non-rational anarchy. Copenhagen indeterminacy undermines this argument. It introduces vast numbers of particular events that are not determined by any law that we know about. The reason this does not bring anarchy into the universe is that there are stochastic or probabilistic laws that govern the behavior of large assemblies of subatomic particles, and that make the observable universe seem deterministic. In so far as all random quantum fluctuations usually cancel each other out when large numbers are involved, however, they do not always cancel out. Chaos theory, which uses fully deterministic equations, shows that very small fluctuations in initial conditions can produce very large and unpredictable changes in macromolecular states. A common illustration is a metal ball poised precariously on top of a semicircular metal ring. The smallest force applied to the ball will tip it one way or the other, but it will fall either onto a switch that will ignite a nuclear bomb, or onto another switch that will dispense a million dollars. This is an example of a tiny change that will produce hugely different effects. For quantum theory, there are millions of such tiny changes, and some of them will produce unpredictable effects on a large scale. So now we know that extraordinary and highly improbable events are possible without breaking any laws of physics. They will, in fact, happen, but only rarely. To say that an event is highly improbable is not to say that it cannot happen. It is to say that it will happen, but not very often. Most of the time, the quantum indeterminacy of the universe will be invisible, and we will not observe the slight distortions of time and space that they, in fact, constantly involve. Stochastic laws are still laws of physics, but they allow extraordinary things to happen. These would, of course, not be miracles if there were no God. But if the prevailing interpretation of quantum theory is accepted. 
two dogmas of determinism have been comprehensively undermined, that every cause has one and only one possible effect, and that all causes can be exhaustively specified and their effects, at least in principle, predicted. There are laws, and without them there could be no science, but quantum theory has rendered obsolete a widely held 18th century view that the universe is wholly determined by inflexible and universal laws that exclude any other causal influence and that completely explain everything that will ever happen. John Polkinghorne speaks of the patchwork character of scientific understanding. Modern physics does not offer a single causal web of known and determinating character. There is, Polkinghorne says, a major gap between the quantum realm and the realm of classical physics that has not yet been bridged by a fully integrated account, and quantum theory and general relativity have never been perfectly reconciled to one another. So, he concludes, science has not demonstrated the causal closure of the natural world. There may be an intrinsic fuzziness or ontological openness in nature that allows the operation of further, largely unknown, causal principles. It looks as though modern physics is mainly concerned with establishing a set of precisely measurable, regular relationships between artificially isolated phenomena under strictly controlled conditions. That such relationships exist and can be mathematically described is an amazing fact about our world which did not have to be true. Einstein remarked that the eternal mystery of the world is its comprehensibility. But the supposition that these relationships, these laws, govern absolutely all phenomena without exception, that they are wholly unbreakable and unchangeable, and that there are no other causal factors to be taken into account in the real world, is not supported by modern physics. As Polkinghorn says, we therefore have no compelling grounds for regarding current theories as being more than a form of approximation to actual physical reality as it is encountered in the limit of effective isolatability. There is probably no statement about the fit between modern physics and the objective world that is not contentious. But we can confidently say that a closed and deterministic view of nature is neither a presupposition of nor a deduction from the practice and established findings of modern physics. Universal physical determinism was suggested to many by the work of Newton, though he did not subscribe to it himself. Contemporary views tend to be much more agnostic about the universal applicability and all-encompassing range of physical laws. There is, after all, no firm and unalterable experience that establishes the existence of unbreakable and deterministic laws of nature. As far as physics is concerned, there could be forms of spiritual causality in nature, though the methodology of physics would preclude a study of them within physics proper. The strongest arguments against miracles will not come from a belief that there are closed, absolute and inflexible laws of nature. They will come from the difficulty of establishing that any spiritual causes have ever been reliably observed. And that is where David Hume concentrates his attack. Can we ever trust testimony to the occurrence of a miracle? Hume says, No testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be of such a kind that its falsehood will be more miraculous than the fact which it endeavours to establish. But is this really a reasonable requirement? Suppose an event occurs that violates a law of physics. For Hume, that should only mean that a normally regular succession of events would on some occasion fail to obtain— such a thing may certainly be improbable, but it could happen. It is hard to quantify the improbability with any certainty. Hume, of course, in his chapter on miracles in An Inquiry Concerning Human Understanding, holds that the probability of such an event is zero, so we could never get a greater improbability. It would follow that no testimony, however strong, could ever establish the occurrence of a miracle. But his chapter on Necessary Connection in the same book establishes that, in fact, it is possible for an unprecedented event to occur. Its improbability is a function of the number of times it has been observed to happen. Thus, an unprecedented event is truly very improbable with regard to normal human expectations, but it could still happen. Now suppose that someone, John, sees such a miracle and reports it to me. Could the falsehood of his report be miraculous? I suppose Hume means that its falsehood must be more improbable than the event he reports. If John is sane, sees the event in good light, has no reason to think he has been tricked, 
is honest and reports it sincerely, it is very improbable that what he says is false. How improbable? Again, that is difficult to quantify exactly, but we could certainly say it is very improbable. So the reported event is very improbable, and the falsehood of John's report is very improbable. To put it another way, it is very likely that John is telling the truth, and what he reports is very unlikely indeed. Hume proposes that I should not believe John unless it is more improbable that what John says is false than that the reported event occurred. That seems a very strong requirement, but it is not as impossible as Hume suggests. What we seem to have is a roughly equal balance of improbabilities. For Hume they cancel each other out, leaving me in a state of total indecision. But I suggest that the balance can be tipped quite strongly on the basis of other factors not yet mentioned, and not simply on the basis of a balancing of probabilities. It is, as Richard Swinburne points out, because Hume fails to mention these other factors that his analysis may seem plausible. In the discussion in the next two sections, I shall gradually spell these factors out. Why improbable events probably occur The strange thing is that situations in which there is a low probability of a person's being mistaken, yet reporting something highly unlikely, occur not infrequently within science. Galileo's observation that there are spots on the sun was very unlikely, given the body of scientific opinion at that time. Should his testimony then have been ignored? In fact, it was, and the Inquisition was entirely reasonable, according to Hume's view, to disbelieve Galileo. But Galileo was right, and it would not have been unreasonable to believe him, given his expertise and the weaknesses of the Aristotelian worldview, which could have been apparent to others if they had thought them through carefully enough. He could have been deceived, though he probably was not. What he observed was very improbable, given current scientific opinion, but that opinion was possibly, and turned out in fact to be, mistaken. Even in science it is not unreasonable to bet one's career, and perhaps even one's whole life, on a theory regarded as highly improbable by one's peers. Einstein did just that for the last twenty years of his life, refusing to accept quantum indeterminacy. He is still generally thought to have probably been wrong, but no one doubts that he was a great physicist, and all admire his tenacity. Nobody thinks he was actually irrational. This is not, of course, just a matter of observing and reporting an improbable event, but it is a case where Einstein's authority, the rather high probability that he was right given his past record, was balanced against the high improbability, given current opinion, of the totally deterministic view he was defending. This situation might indeed lead most of us to be agnostic, letting this battle of probabilities end in a draw. Yet some practicing physicists just have to commit themselves one way or another. They have to bet on Einstein's authority or on quantum indeterminacy. Their decision will help to determine the research programs they pursue, and perhaps the whole course of their working lives. The point is that it is perfectly reasonable and a positively good thing that different scientists should bet different ways. It is a good thing that their theories go well beyond the evidence, because this is a matter of great practical importance. This precise issue is not yet resolved. There are quantum physicists like David Bohm who have propounded a consistently deterministic account of quantum phenomena by introducing a pilot wave that would signal changes throughout the universe at superluminal speeds. But the consensus is still that many basic subatomic events are non-deterministic, and that hidden variables like pilot waves are explicitly excluded by quantum theory. Perhaps the issue will be resolved one day. The hope of science is that there will be a testable resolution of such problems. But at present, the situation is rather like that in religious matters, where there is either a god or there is not. Miracles either occur or they do not, but there is no currently available way of deciding the issue definitively. Expert observations of events that conflict with currently accepted scientific laws are the very stuff of scientific discovery and progress. The Bell Theorem, that there are non-local connections between subatomic particles that have once interacted but have become widely separated, is widely accepted among physicians even though it requires either affirming faster-than-light connections or treating separated two-particle systems as one very strange single object, and even though it is extremely difficult to replicate experimental proofs of the theorem. In this case, the expertise of the physicists in question, 
and the mathematical elegance of the theorem outweigh the inconvenience that there is no completely convincing way of reconciling it with the theory of relativity. The moral of these stories is that what we might call the probability of an event is not an absolute and unchanging quantity. It depends upon a whole background context against which events are taken to be more or less probable. If there is no God, an event breaking a law of nature would seem to be quite improbable to us, though possible. But it would have no point, and so would be relatively unintelligible. It would just be an odd occurrence, and we might be well advised as scientists to ignore it. Nevertheless, there might in fact be huge numbers of such events, unknown to and unobserved by us, so it might not be very improbable at all. It is only improbable relative to our experience, which we admit to be extremely limited. If there is a God, however, what we will consider to be probable changes considerably. We might not want to go as far as Newton did and say that God could do anything God wants and leave the realm of physical law intact. Then we would have a severe problem, not a scientific one, about why God does not just improve the universe and eliminate all natural disasters. We might want to postulate a universe that runs according to general and, on the whole, predictable laws, but we might also want to deny that such laws account for everything that happens, or that everything can be completely predicted, or that there can be no non-physical causal influences. Modern physics provides some justification for taking such a stance. So, if we believe there is a God, the probability that there are spiritual causes at work in the universe is considerably raised and so is the probability that some of those causes may be extraordinary. The Resurrection of Jesus as a Paradigmatic Miracle If there were a God, there would be at least one case of non-physical causality, for God creates the universe. There is no general law that whenever there is a God there follows a universe like this. Any explanation of God's action would have to be what Richard Swinburne has called a personal explanation, in terms of a unique, unrepeatable purpose. So, God could make things happen in ways that could not be brought under any general law of nature. If God creates the universe for a purpose, it is rather likely that there will be causal influences of God's purpose upon parts of the creation. It is likely, therefore, that there will be states of affairs, or perhaps aspects of states of affairs, that could not be brought under purely physical and non-purposeful laws of nature. They would not be miracles unless they were extraordinary, or inspiring and specifically revelatory of God's presence or power. They might occur unobserved and undetected, but they would be there. In this case, the occurrence of a miracle would still be highly improbable, relative to the normal way in which things proceed but it might be quite probable that a miracle should occur if there were good reason for God to cause an awe-inspiring event that reveals something of spiritual importance. The context makes all the difference. To put it briefly, we would reasonably be much more inclined to believe someone's testimony to a miracle, a very improbable event, if that miracle fitted into, while perhaps also expanding considerably, a more general understanding of God's purpose for the universe. Take the case of the resurrection of Jesus, which Hume really had in mind in his discussion. Here is a claim by a group of people to have seen Jesus after his death. It is unlikely they were lying, since most of them were martyred for their belief. It is unlikely they were deceived, for the appearances of Jesus were spread out over a length of time in various locations and corroborated by many observers. Yet it remains possible they were deceived, or that original reports of their visionary experiences later got exaggerated. The resurrection itself is highly unlikely, since people have not otherwise been seen to rise from the dead. Yet this judgment may change if there is a God, if God revealed to the prophets of Israel that there would be a Messiah, if Jesus were a great spiritual teacher, and if the resurrection could be plausibly seen as a confirmation of the true Messiahship of Jesus. Then the resurrection would become intelligible as a disclosure by the Creator in and through the person of Jesus that the ultimate destiny of humanity is to be raised from death to eternal life. All these things, it need hardly be said, are disputable, but they are an important part of the context of Christian claims that a miracle occurred. In addition, Christian teaching is that humans are trapped in self-centered arrogance and can be liberated by the inner presence of the risen Christ. 
The message that Jesus died and rose again to forgive sin and to bring eternal life with God is both a challenge to reassess our lives and commit ourselves to worship the God revealed in Christ and the offer of a dynamic power to help us to do so. It provides a vision of human life as oriented toward supreme value and promises to transform human life with a new vitality. This may sound a bit like a sermon. I do not mean it to be that, but it is only fair to stress that miracles are events of religious significance. They are meant to disclose the reality of God and to transform the lives of those who are open to that disclosure. Hume fails to mention any of this, not surprisingly, since he does not think there is any religious significance or any God. But it is inaccurate to represent a miracle as though it were just a very odd event that we simply have to consider dispassionately and without any personal involvement. So, Hume says that he would not believe any testimony that Queen Elizabeth I rose from the dead and governed England for three months. The fact is that, however astonishing such an event would be, it would have no religious significance. It would not confirm in her courtiers their belief that she was a messenger of God, or their ultimate hope of eternal life with God, and it would not, I presume, transfigure their lives by a sudden inrush of the Holy Spirit. There are two main factors lacking in the imagined resurrection of Queen Elizabeth that were present in the alleged resurrection of Jesus. One is a historical context, a long tradition of prayer and spiritual experience in Israel which included the hope of a Messiah or spiritual liberator, together with a historical estimate of the spiritual insight and authority of Jesus. The other is the existential factor of disclosure, challenge, and personal transformation by which some people, but not all, feel encountered by a reality of supreme value disclosed in the risen Jesus that can transform their lives. Since miracles occur in a religious tradition, are connected with the lives of those who claim spiritual authority, and are claimed to mediate the presence and power of a supreme spiritual reality, any estimate of the probability of their occurrence will depend upon your attitude to that tradition, that alleged authority, and that alleged spiritual reality. For Christianity, the crucial question will be not, can a dispassionate survey of the evidence give proof beyond any reasonable doubt that Jesus rose from the dead, but... Is the reality of God mediated in a liberating way through Jesus, whose life is recorded in the Gospels and whose presence is known in the Church? At this point atheists have to answer no, but it is not irrational to answer yes. For those who choose the latter answer, the probability of the disciples' testimony that Jesus rose from death must rise considerably. It will still not become a theoretical certainty. Faith enters in not as belief wholly without evidence, but as commitment to a loyalty and discipleship that evaluates the evidence for the existence of God in the facts of nature, the historical evidence of Jesus' life and teaching, and the personal experience of millions of believers, including that of the evaluator, in a positive way. Miracles in Different Religious Contexts I have dealt with the miracle of the resurrection because that is what really concerned Hume, even though he misrepresented the belief abysmally. Other religions have their own miracles, their own disclosures of spiritual reality and transformation. This, of course, is used by Hume to show that the evidence for miracles is weakened even further by the fact that the miracles of different religions contradict one another. Jews and Muslims do not accept the miracle of the resurrection of Jesus. That is not, I think, because of a difference in weighing its probability in the abstract. Jews do not think Jesus was the Messiah because he did not bring in an age of peace and justice. Since he was not the anointed messenger of God, it would not be appropriate for God to raise him from the dead. In addition, disclosures of God come to Jews not through Jesus, but through the law and the prophets. So they dislike the Christian rejection of the law and the Christian insistence on the necessity of redemption by a human person instead of by obedience to the Torah. For these reasons, the miracle of the resurrection seems spiritually, not physically, implausible. It does not fit with Jewish views of God, God's method of self-revelation, and their own spiritual experience. Muslims, in a rather different way, accept Jesus as a messenger of God, but are hostile to regarding any human, including Jesus, as divine, and to the Christian doctrine of the Trinity. So, they do not accept that Jesus, a true prophet, was crucified as a criminal. He did not rise from death, they think. 
nor did he die. He ascended directly to the presence of God from whence he will return on judgment day. And because they believe Christians are in general deceived about the divinity of Jesus, Muslims have some reason to distrust the testimony of the apostles to the resurrection. Thus, it is background beliefs about the nature of God, the nature of divine revelation, and the most adequate forms of personal spiritual experience that account for Jewish and Muslim skepticism about the resurrection. Jews and Muslims have their own normative miracles, the Exodus and the Quran, respectively. It is these events that for them disclose the nature of God and challenge them to commit their lives to the quest for the good. The upshot is that miracles are only spiritually plausible, and therefore only accounted worthy of belief if they fit into a background of beliefs about spiritual reality and how it is authentically known in historical and personal experience. Miracles are not indubitable events that will convince unbelievers, though that is the sort of thing unbelievers often seem to think that they should be. This shows something important about religious belief. Religious belief does not depend upon a dispassionate analysis of evidence that leads to conviction beyond a reasonable doubt. It is always a commitment made in response to an insight that is individual and unique. Your miracles do not contradict mine. What you accept as a miracle depends upon what you think the supreme spiritual power is and upon why you think it should ever act in extraordinary ways. So, a Christian can say, the resurrection of Jesus is an event that discloses the purpose of a suffering and life-giving God and founds a new community for implementing that purpose. A Buddhist can say, I see no such God and no such purpose. So this alleged event seems not only unlikely but spiritually misleading. Therefore, I do not accept that it happened. But I would expect an enlightened being to be omniscient in all matters relating to liberation, so, to me, stories of the Buddha's superhuman knowledge disclose the nature of enlightenment and the spiritual goal of human life. In reply, a Christian is almost bound to say, I am much more skeptical about such stories because I do not accept that the Buddha was really omniscient. He did not, for instance, know about God. Thus it is reasonable to accept the occurrence of miracles, but only if they fit into a pattern of beliefs about the nature of a spiritual reality, whether God or the spiritual capacities of liberated souls that is likely to act occasionally in extraordinary ways, or that is likely to give rise to extraordinary human powers. Hume is correct in thinking that miracles cannot be presented as proofs of God, since it is only reasonable to accept them if you already believe in God or in spiritual reality. Nevertheless, if you think there is a God who has a purpose for the world, and you think the purpose has become obscured because of human self-will, then you may be surprised if there are no extraordinary manifestations of the divine presence and purpose. In that case, the occurrence of some miracles will confirm your pre-existing belief. And miracles may not only confirm, but also modify that prior belief in important ways, just as the resurrection of Jesus modified the disciples' expectations about what the Messiah would be and do. In that way, the occurrence of miracles may be important to religious belief, though miracles will never function as independent proofs of the truth of a religious view. Conclusion Miracles and Scientific Law Miracles have been prevalent in the traditional form of most religions. They are extraordinary events that show spiritual power, that of either God or a spiritually liberated soul. Their primary importance is religious, showing something about the presence and nature of spiritual reality and communicating a transforming encounter with such a reality. Since religions are mostly founded on the axiom that spirit exists and has causal power, it would not be surprising to find some extraordinary physical manifestations of such power, probably focused upon some person who is believed to have an especially intense and authentic experience of spirit. Legends readily multiply, and human imagination is strong. It is therefore reasonable to be very cautious in affirming that a miracle has occurred. On the other hand, Miracles seem to be possible even in the law-governed universe of modern science, for science does not show the universe to be a closed and complete causal web. For all science knows, there may be real spiritual causes, though science excludes them from experimental consideration, since they are unlikely to be law-like and predictable in their operation. Such causes would modify, rather than break, purely physical laws, and there is nothing in science that would make this impossible. Miracles, however, are not 
proofs of God. An assessment of whether miracles occur will depend upon your background beliefs and upon whether you think transforming encounters with a spiritual reality are possible. It will depend upon whether you think the testimony to a miracle is reliable, upon whether you think the event falls within a wider intelligible pattern of spiritual purpose, and upon whether you think that what the miracle discloses is spiritually profound and important enough to warrant the occurrence of such an extraordinary event. Questions can be raised at every stage of this discussion. The whole idea of spirit as a non-material causal power may be rejected. The admitted amount of legend, delusion, and fraud in religion may be considered to outweigh any alleged evidence in favor of a miracle. Even though Hume's specific arguments are quite weak, the evidence for miracles is often from a long time ago, reported by only a few witnesses who have a strong interest in the occurrence of miracles and relating to events very unlike anything seen in contemporary closely observed experience. It may be thought that the success of the scientific method strongly suggests that all real explanations must come in the form of experimentally established and predictable assertions, and that all real knowledge must be based on public and tested observations. Alleged miracles may then be seen as throwbacks to a fairy tale, pre-scientific view of the universe that has not yet recognized that events happen in accordance with law, and not by the will of invisible entities. Nevertheless, I think any dispassionate thinker would have to concede that David Hume's arguments against miracles are not at all convincing, and that the theory that the universe is a closed and complete causal web is no better proved by science than is the theory that the universe is created by God. Both theories go well beyond the strictly scientific evidence. There is something to be said for both. But as far as the question of this chapter is concerned, I think it has to be said that the laws of nature, as modern science understands them, do not exclude the occurrence of miracles. That, of course, does not settle the question of whether miracles occur, a question that must be settled on other grounds.